ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring, the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. Welcome back, amicable divorcing listeners. As you know, this podcast is a podcast devoted to amicable divorces, but there are times when we have a topic that's really not part of the legal divorce, at least on the surface, but can influence decisions within the legal divorce outside of and inside the courtroom. Divorce styling is one of those topics. We have on our show today, Holly Katz, the style coach and host of her own podcast, Fashion Crimes, which I love. Holly, welcome. Thank you so much. I mean, if you have to commit a crime, maybe fashion crime is one of the worst you can commit. (laughs) I agree. I agree. And you do need get out of jail free cards, don't you, with your styling? Absolutely. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And if you were never shown, if you were never taught, you know, style is a skill that can be learned, but a lot of people try and miss or don't try. No, you're so right. You're absolutely right. And living in Los Angeles, you're in Atlanta, right? Correct. Yes. Very fashionable city, and uh, well, getting to be more and more and more and well, no- more well known for being an entertainment capital, and with entertainment comes fashion. So, right. you are perfectly set. Holly is certified in personal, corporate, and commercial styling, but now she's going to be certified by virtue of this program <laughs> in divorce styling. Right. And for both men and women, not exclusively women, right? That's correct. Um, most people, my tagline is, your, if your husband looks bad, that's your fault. Um, because <laughs> he doesn't know, right? He doesn't know what he doesn't know. And I have styled several men. And most of them come from a place of, you know, my wife doesn't have time to show me or help me or she's not really sure. So she's handed me off to a professional. And I really enjoy when men have the energy and enthusiasm of dressing well, of being interested in fashion. It it really pleases me. Well, you know, I always tell the story. I cleaned out my husband's closet three times. Once we were dating, once we were engaged, once we were married. Three very different experiences. (laughs) And as someone top, top level corporate in the corporate world, it, it's, it's confusing because in the 80s, people had to dress up, wear suits, you wear pantyhose. The world has done a complete 180. So it's very confusing to people, whether you're corporate level or not, or C-level executive or not, what is business casual? People don't know what that means. And it is very hard if you don't, you know, I always say you either got the shopping gene or you don't. And if you don't, it's fine. It can be learned. But it is really hard for people to decipher what is too casual and what is too dressy. Um, and so I help people sort through that. That's just one thing, one facet of what I do. And we're going to get to everything that you do in a few minutes. But here's why Holly is on the show today. Holly and I have a mutual friend. Her name is Tracy. Tracy is also in the broadcast podcast world. And Tracy was reading an article from the Wall Street Journal earlier in February titled, Forget Wedding Dresses, Divorce Style Has Arrived. So knowing that I have a divorce podcast, knowing that Holly is the guru, the style coach, she hooked us up. I read the article and I said, we absolutely have to do an episode on this because honestly and truly, it, the way you dress in court and out of court, really makes a difference in how your settlement goes. And just in general, how the judge is viewing you if you have to go to court. So here's what I would like to do. I want to quickly read through this article. And I want you to comment as we're going, Holly, because it's a short article. And then we're going to go into every single thing you do for people and how you approach styling to make it user-friendly when you're gone. 
Okay. Okay. So here's the article. Um, there was a recent hubbub in Mary Kate Olson's divorce from uh, her husband. And um, it was hearkened back to the old divorces of the past when people were really glamorous. So here's how it goes. Wedding Style's evil stepsister, the divorce look, is gaining clout now. When child star turned fashion mogul Mary Kate Olson and French banker, her husband, Olivier Sarkozy, finalized their divorce last month, I think meaning January, and it was via Zoom. Screenshots of the proceeding, proceedings taken from court reporters went viral. Miss Olson, whose brand The Row, have you known about this brand The Row, Holly? Yes. Okay, yes. well, it's new to me, and I thought I knew everything. <laughs> Apparently, I don't. Um, epitomizes quiet sophistication. She wore a chic black turtleneck that was instantly dissected and mean. And then I guess she has this, a more casual, unkept look to her hair. It just seemed to go hand in hand with her look. Holly, what did you think of her look? I don't understand why it was noteworthy because I felt like she didn't dress up. So why did they, I guess just because she's a famous person and she kind of got thrown into the spotlight for, hey, people are doing divorces during Zoom. People are buying houses over Zoom. People are doing a lot of things over Zoom. And I just, and it wasn't about what she was wearing was so great. However, it, it you know, she is chic and she is known in the fashion world, but she really did not dress up in my opinion. I just, I just think she kept it simple and classic and wasn't trying to be glammed up. And so maybe that's why they spoke about her. Cause I don't know if anyone else's divorce was made public who has been divorced during COVID. Um, Cause usually people sit in the same room as you know, right. Um, if there's a people, trial if there's a trial and people right. just don't do that anymore. So I just, I don't think it, it was about what she was wearing. I think it is about who she is and she is so young and I don't think she's been married to him that long actually, but um, you know, she wore a turtleneck. Okay. She could have worn a trash bag. She probably still would have been in the news. Um, but it's, it's about to your point, going in front of the judge and what, how you present yourself, it, it matters. It, it totally matters. Well, I'm really happy to hear you say that because I wasn't impressed. To be honest with you, what I, my input in all of this, so I don't go to court. I don't represent people in my non-podcast world. I'm a divorce mediator and I'm what you call a legal document preparation company, which means I'm a paralegal on steroids. I file for people. I'm, I'm additionally licensed to file for people in an amicable divorce, so to speak, where they don't have any hearings. They don't want to go to trial. Everything they do will be in a settlement agreement. But... I file enough standalone requests for hearings where self-represented people do go in. And a few years ago, I did a little bit more trial prep work in terms of the paperwork for people who were self-represented and had to go in on their own. They just didn't know how to do the paperwork. And I always said to them, please dress your best. You are the one speaking directly to the judge. You are going to have to, the judge is going to have to find favor with you in every aspect of your being, your performance. And we all have subtle biases. And those subtle biases are present in court rulings, believe it or not. And it used to be in the old days, <laughs> five years ago, that's called the old days, but it used to be even a little bit longer than that. Female attorneys had a very specific way they had to dress. They couldn't wear slacks. They had to wear skirts and dresses, low pumps, gray, black, navy blue suits. That's it. That's all they could wear. Men normally just wore those colors. So I guess most of the attention was on women. And so that in my remedial way is my investment. But to your point, I'll go on here. 
So the enthusiastic online response to the screenshot evoked the glory days of Hollywood divorces. When um, awestruck, when people watching awestruck uh, for stars like Elizabeth Taylor, eight marriages, eight times she had to go to court. Zsa Gabor, nine marriages. Well, Larry King, although he just died, he was on his ninth marriage too. So these were called serial breakup glam looks. And when Marilyn Monroe divorced Joe DiMaggio in 1954 after nine months of marriage, that was a long marriage in her, in her time, um, she wore a little black dress, high pumps, and white gloves to the courthouse. Holly, can we translate that look to modern times? I wish we could, but here's the thing. If you don't know, you don't know. And again, I, I always say I can line up 100 women. 20% of those women, they got it. They look good. They take care of themselves. They know how to shop. They got it. 60% of those women are kind of in the middle. They look good. Maybe they exercise. Maybe they don't. They can come together in a clutch. Oh, my God, I have a wedding. Oh, my God, I have this. Uh, but day to day, they don't enjoy shopping. They don't love fashion. And they just do the bare minimum to get by. Last 20%, don't know, don't care. We'll never try. We'll ne have the same look for 25 years. We'll never wear a makeup. We'll never, that's, that's not my client. That 60% of the population maybe 60% of women who get divorced, they're going to say, throw on a dress from their closet and say, I'm going to court, maybe I'll wear this. Otherwise, they don't know. They don't know any better. So they don't think it's important or they're not going to dress any different from how they would to go to work. And it is a lack of education. And I call it a life skill that goes by the wayside. When you are a child, most parents teach you manners and, and how to behave. Dressing is not a part of that. And that's what I'm finding in my clients today as grown adults. Maybe they know a little bit, maybe they don't, but they don't feel comfortable making their own decisions and spending money on fashion and clothes because they think it's frivolous and they think it's superficial. So I coach people on the who, what, when, where, why. Who are you? Where are you in your life today? What do you need? What do you want? What's your block? So if you are a person who just kind of does the bare minimum, you're not going to show up glamorous to court because you don't know what you don't know. You're going to show up in an average everyday outfit. So it's really up to the, the person to, to kind of step it up, you know, and, and seek professional help if they're not sure. Well, glamour of the 50s is definitely different than glamour of the 2020s. I, I agree with you there. People don't wear gloves anymore. People don't wear pearls as much as they did. But there's still a modern day version of appropriate wardrobe, depending on where you're going. Obviously, if you're going to a wedding Unless it says completely casual, you're not going to wear jeans. You're not going to hopefully, you know, wear anything that you would go to the movies in. You know, hopefully you understand when you're going to a wedding, it's a little bit more formal affair. But people don't realize that when they go to court. Well, the courts aren't glamorous to start with, but they do have their priorities. You know, there's a way you speak. There was a way you conduct yourself. There's a way you respond to a judge. And especially those who are representing themselves. Um, there's a lot of pressure on them to speak for themselves. And they need to be comfortable, yet they need to know that their appearance matters. And there's this one little excerpt in, in the article as I continue on. It says... Um, Yet few would deny that one's appearance plays a role in the outcome with so much at stake in court, money, home, and custody. And it even references a law firm in North Carolina that offers, offers the services of a high-end stylist like you, Holly, and posts style ideas. Now, this made me laugh, though, because I'm thinking, okay, she has a very wealthy clientele and post style ideas such as Prada pumps and Valextra handbags. 
okay, I know what Prada is. I've not heard of Alextra. I mean, that is somebody who is pretty fashion savvy, obviously. Um, and it's somebody who maybe they're requesting, you know, what do you think I should wear? You know, when you work with an attorney, you know, they are on your side. They probably, you become very friendly with them. And, you know, a good attorney will throw that out there and say, hey, by the way, make sure you're dressed like this or like that or whatever. And if they are smart enough to hire a stylist, you know, good on them. That good, good on them. Um, I, I feel like if you are willing to take that extra step, you know, you have to seek professional help. And whether it's me or another stylist, you know, when you go to the store, ask for help. That's what the people work there for. I mean, so they can sort of guide you in the right direction. So true. So true. You know, I forgot that they actually do have people at certain department stores um, that can guide you. Right. I mean, they do have, uh, you know, the higher end stores have personal styling services. um, But of course, that costs extra. But if you're going to a high end department store, you probably can afford that anyway. But if you're going to a different department store, a more moderately priced one, you know, you're kind of on your own. I mean, it's, it, again, it's very different than how it used to be. The shopping experience is very different. But find someone in the store that you like and find someone who will give you a good opinion and tell them what you're doing, where you're going, and they will help you to the best of their ability. Most people are very helpful. I'm going to continue on in a second, but a question just occurred to me. Do you take clients around the country and fly to them? I do. Okay, good. That's good to know. So here's an interesting excerpt in this article. I think that a divorce, and it's probably the female attorney they referenced that offers um, uh, stylist consultations on her website. Um, I think that a divorce or a separation is in some ways a reclaiming of who you are outside of your previous relationship, your, your marriage. And I think that you can see that reflected in clothes. The outfits are very specific to who you are. I always say in my confirmation letters when I'm booking people in the office for either mediation or to begin the filing for a divorce, divorce is a new beginning. And it's an opportunity to make a lot of decisions that can turn your life around. The way you look is one of those decisions because I think in talking to you, Holly, and we'll get into this more in a couple minutes, you give people permission to put themselves first every now and then. And part of that is what makes you feel good. And what makes you look good generally makes you feel good. Your comments on that? Nailed it. I mean, you nailed it. I'm like a therapist, you know, I I really am because I get, I ask the very, I do the inner work with people. I I get to the very difficult questions that people are just skirting by because it's too hard and it's too emotional. I get a lot of, I get a lot of tear, you know, I get two kinds of customers, the kind of people that lay themselves on the railroad tracks and say, do me you know, that are beyond ready. They're overdue. I know I need this. What do I have to do? Then I get the people who are post-divorce, post-baby, or had children late in life and maybe their body didn't snap back, or new marriage, or something that is life-changing, new career, where they're pushed over the cliff and they're like, well, what do I do now? type deal. And then every person who I work with says, I should have done this five years ago. I should have done this 10 years ago. Because you don't know what you don't know. And that's okay. Uh, But, you know, people will not do this unless they are pushed in some capacity. And sometimes it's looking in the mirror and going, ugh, every day and they've had enough. Or they are just tired of not finding clothes that fit correctly. So, you know, I have a very intricate process of what I do when I go, when I work with people and some people are easier than others, but it's, it's the finished product is what I know in the core of my soul that it affects every area of your life. And what I'm talking about is the energy shift. When I work, let's just use you as an example. 
if you came to me and said, I just had a baby, you know, my body didn't snap back. I had kids late in life. What do I do? We would start at the beginning. And then you would realize that what you give to yourself, you give to your family. And that's how I hit my new moms right in the heart. You want to be a good mom? You're so worried about spending $5 on this and, and, and skimping on you and whatever. When you skimp on you, your kids notice that. And that's how they grow up. Well, my mom did everything for us. Well, what about, did she do anything for her? And then you grow up thinking that you don't, you can't give to you because you have to be as committed as your mom was. Oh, and, I think, yes, it was so important what you just said. And, yes. it, and it's a really vicious cycle. And, and there's a difference between running out and buying a, a $10,000 bag and throwing yourself a bone every four months and saying, you know what, I do deserve a few new things. And maybe I can skimp on, your, you know what, your kids are fine. But for you to just run, roll over you, that's on you. And it's up to you to get yourself out. You know, I, and I think you hit a nail on the head in terms of um, co-parenting, single mom, single dad. Um, people don't people don't know how to balance what they do for their kids versus themselves. And I think children, well, first of all, children want to see their parents happy. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You cannot scream that from the mountaintops. I, I mean, honestly, I am a step parent and, you know, we had to have to come to Jesus, I, you know, my stepson and I. And I said, you want your father to be happy. And he said, I know, I know, I know. I said, I'm not saying this is easy, but in the end, this is what you want. You just don't know it right now because you're too young and that's okay. But as you become an adult, you will realize that the same way I realized that when my parents were divorced and remarried. It's not easy. Ah, oh, you were a child of divorce. I didn't know that. Yes. Horrible, disgusting, awful textbook divorce. Oh, I'm so that, sorry. Oh, that's okay. That affected me as an adult. And you have to, and that's what makes me, I think, a great step parent is that I know how to coach him through divorce. It's not fun, you know, and they co-parented for a long time and did the best they could, but it was painful. It's, pain, it's hurt. It's, it's painful when you don't get along it really and you got to fake it. And that's, you know, it's, it's hard. It is, and it's really hard to be a step parent too. I mean, you're walking on an emotional landmine yes. all the time. Yes, and I always like to say, nobody cares what you think. You know, you you get to watch, you get the privilege. But I did. I chose by choice. I'm childless by choice. I chose not to have my own children, and so. I get the privilege of watching and helping someone grow up, but he can never blame me for messing up his life. And that's what makes step parenting so fun is that I get to watch and participate, but I'm not in the major decision-making category. And all, you know, and I respect that. I understand that. And look, he is a amazing leader, you know, wonderful citizen, you know, amazing person in society, smarter than I ever was. I mean, that goes beyond saying, but he's going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? I, look how good I turned out. Okay. I mean, that's, that's what I like to say to people. Horrible divorce from the eighties with my parents did not get along. Couldn't be in the same room. This wedding, that wedding, this issue, that issue, me graduating from here. I mean, it was painful because the, just having them sit at the same table was Raining. a problem. It was a Raining. problem. I know. And, and, and even if, when they're faking it, when you're old enough, you know they're faking it. And that's hard. But again, that's life. You're going to be okay. You know, the kids are going to be okay. But coming back to you as the parent, I just would love to use my, if you don't mind, to use my husband as an example, because he did not know what he did not know fashionably. And I said to him, let me be your selfish coach. This is your act too. This is about you. I have never not wanted to do what I wanted to do. I've never been divorced. I've never been married. This is my first marriage, his second. And he was like, I never knew I could be this happy. 
never knew. Da, 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 da. I never knew. I said, because it's all about you. You don't have to throw yourself in the pit just because you're in dad mode. You know, and that's just what happens. You feel guilty and you feel bad and you're at every practice, you're at every game, you're doing this and you don't really have that much of a social life because you're trying to be there for your kid because you feel bad, they're in two hunt, whatever. And then you skimp on you. Some people know it, some people don't know it. And when I styled my husband, let me tell you, he is drinking the Kool-Aid. Okay. I mean, he is loving how he's looking. He loves shopping because he understands how to do it. And when men give men other compliments, you know, you're doing something right. Ooh, that is the epitome. Mm -hmm. I love when men comment favorably on each other. It really, it warms my heart. uh, From him. And I'll, this is amazing. I'll make this a quick story. You know, you have to take your shoes off to the airport and he had these really cool socks on. And then the stewardess handed him a note on the plane from a woman that was hitting on him because of his socks. <gasps> and I looked at him. He showed me the note. He felt so bad. I, I looked at him. I said, you're welcome. <laughs> yes. yes. You're welcome. He was like, I can't believe it. I said, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. That's crazy. Women notice that. Women notice that. Women notice nails. Does a man, is a man groomed? Do they have manicures, pedicures? Women notice things like that. If you're a man, I, it's number five. Hair, teeth, watch, shoes, nails. In that That's order? What, uh, not, I mean, but those are the keep five. It up. You, those okay. are the five. And if okay. you got like a beard, facial, that goes with hair, you got to keep it tight. You got to keep it tight. If you're going to rock the facial hair, it's got to be tight. You can't let it go. You know, what we're I'm not saying? talking Abraham Lincoln. We're, <laughs> you're right. And if you're balding, I have a whole nother lecture about you're losing your hair. Big deal. Let's, let's roll with that. Okay. Let's roll with it. You, don't fake it. Don't try to be somebody who you're not. Let's enhance that look and get you looking sharp. Because yes. believe me, nobody cares if you're losing your hair if you dress well. Nobody cares. Women that's, don't You know, care. that's really true. And there are women who are very attracted to bald men. I mean, it is just not that serious. It re- it, it, I agree. I agree. It's just not. I mean... It, it's, it's, but it's a hard thing for men to go through. I know. I, I, but I think I would worry if I was losing hair. I totally would too. But then you get everything else sharp and you are good to go. That is true. Okay. So just to end with the divorce look, and then we're going to start with how you even approach a look period is nothing too tight or flashy in court. No pieces that have you pulling at them to adjust uh, while you're standing up and talking. Because if you're self-representing, you're going to be standing up in front of the judge and talking. Or even if you're sitting down and you're wearing a skirt or a dress and you're a woman, oh God, please don't make it too far above the knee. You know, nothing, nothing that would distract the judge. I, I guess that's how I would say that. And then I, this may sound a little pedantic, but check your makeup, brush your hair, and evaluate your overall appearance before you walk into the courtroom. Because honestly and truly, judges are affected by the way you look. And, and it doesn't mean they're that fashionable. They have the robe on, who knows what's underneath. But there is a certain decorum that they are looking for, and they call it respect. And that's how they look at the way we dress when we go into court. So with that in mind, Holly, and because divorce is a new beginning, and you believe in new beginnings all the time, let's start with you. I want to just give people a little bit of your uh, background before you became who you are now, because I love this. You went to New York City and you trained with Betsy Johnston or Johnson? I Johnson. Always, Johnson. And Betsy Johnson had a real style. She was very floral oriented. She was out there. She was definitely left of center in her styling, correct? Uh, yes. 
Beyond left of center, yes. <laughs> so you got that. And then on your website, I loved this. You're next to Anna Winter, the editor of Vogue, the character that Meryl Streep um, referenced in Devil Wears Prada. What were you doing with Anna? Um, I, let, let me tell you, the fashion gods were looking down on me. Um, on that moment, I happened to be at the same event that she was at, at. She was at, and the girl who I was with, the woman who I was with, said, "Oh my God, there's Anna Wintour," and it was like an outer body experience when she said, "Go get a picture with her. Go get a picture with her." She was in my ear, and I went, and I didn't know what to say or, or do, and she was standing pretty close to me, and she said, "When are you ever going to see her again?" When are you ever going to be in the same room with her again? So I went up to her and asked her for a photo, and she said yes. So I was very grateful. That is so nice. And she was wearing sunglasses. That's her signature look indoors and outdoors. I love this. All the time. She's actually on Instagram promoting her master class, a series of, I guess, webinars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've done master class. I did a couple master classes. The one I loved so much with is with Sarah Blakely and she um, is the founder of Spanx if you're familiar with oh, Spanx and what they are and their office is based here in Atlanta and it was the best I've ever I mean it was her master class was amazing but anyway I have not done Anna Wintour's yet well we should both go to that <laughs> as a child how did you get interested in fashion so the Jews came over you know from Ellis Island and some of the Jews went north, some of them went west, and a lot of them went south. And my family, my grandparents, went south. And my grandparents had a store, which they passed down to some of their brothers and sisters' children, who are more my mother's cousins. And then my grandfather had his own store, which was children's clothes. Then my father opened up his own in the 70s and 80s, had his own clothing, women's clothing store. And so I grew up around, and then my mother is on the retail floor still to this day. So I have grown up around fashion and clothes my whole life. It's just what I know. And then I have a, several certifications, retail ma- management, merchandising, fashion styling, wardrobe styling, personal styling, menswear styling. I have a BFA in fashion design. And so I moved to New York um, to pursue a career in fashion. I just want to breathe for a second because I love fashion. If I had another life, I would probably do that. Um, But at least I can shop. (laughs) That's how I say it. Good for you. You're ahead of the game. You're ahead of the game. Believe me. Oh, I love shopping. I, I cannot tell you how energized I am. And that, it doesn't even matter what store I'm in. It's just so much fun to shop. And I really do understand how clothes can affect you, how you feel. And it's not superfluous. It's not shallow. It's integral to who you are as a human being and an individual. And would you please share some of your philosophies that support that? I'm happy to. Um, You know, regardless of age, you know, I want to separate, I want to do this first. Style, having good style does not mean wearing expensive clothes. Having good style does not mean you're skinny and pretty. That's not what that means. So I like to shatter those concepts right when I meet somebody. When I meet someone who is really, really, really budget conscious and afraid to spend money, it is a financial block. And I help them through that. When someone has body issues and I help them through that. And when I mean hand-holding, I mean literal hand-holding because nobody other than a real therapist is going to coach you through, you know what, the way you look is okay and, and stop saying it's not because it is. Because you can't do anything about it this second, so let's take that ball and run with it. And I always like to say for my clients who have body issues or they feel like they need to lose weight, 
great style. And, uh, and the model, Ashley Graham, who was a plus size model, said this best. Great style has no size. This is the best time in the history of humanity to be plus size. Especially if you're plus size today in 2020, you have no excuse. You have more choices than ever, ever were. Try being fat in the 50s <laughs> or being fat in the 70s or the 80s. It wasn't fun because there were no, cl- because designers were not inclusive. That's true. And, they're, and they're getting a lot of pressure from the public to be size inclusive. And not everyone does it and they have their reasons for doing it or not doing it. Find the designer or the, the clothing that works best for your body type. And that's where I take everyone to zero. You are at zero. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means you're on step one. Step one is what is your body type? And I help you figure that out. Step two, let's get you in the right undergarments. If it's a woman, it's bra, the right bra, the right underwear. If it's a man, it's you will wear an undershirt and I will take that to the grave, whether you like it or not. Men don't understand you have to wear an undershirt, period, exclamation point, end of sentence. Okay, tell me why. I don't understand. Because you can see through a man's shirt. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. And you must wear an undershirt and don't, and and a lot of men do it and they wear the wrong undershirt, which means you can see it underneath. You know, if you're wearing a butt down shirt, you have to wear a V-neck so you can't see it. And Ah, men, men don't know that. If you're really, if you have a really, really hairy chest, not a problem. Wear an undershirt, (laughs) you know, and the only lenience is that is that if you're super young and in your twenties, yeah, you can get away with it, but not. When you're a grown man, sorry. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it just is what it is, right? I mean, and, and I have people don't know. You have to coach people on that. Okay, so I have a question written and in, in, in it is, is there a psychology to fashion? Is there, what, how should people turn their thinking about fashion and the relevance and priority it will have in their lives as individuals and in their lives as parents. It's either you want to do it or you don't. You want to go on a diet or you don't. You want to exercise or you don't. You want to make fashion a priority or you don't. And if you do, you will. That, that's what it is. It is no different from going on a diet or no different from making a different change in your life or saying, I want to be more clean from now on. I want to clean up my living room or whatever. It, it's, it's no different. If you want to step into that, you will. And the stars will align for you. But you cannot say, I want to do it and then half do it or never get around to it because then you're lying to yourself. And I'm, you know, tell the truth, look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself the truth. You either think you look good or you know you don't look good. And if you don't look well or don't dress the way you want to dress, it is not that hard to find someone to guide you in the right direction. You have to make that decision. I'm going to do it or I'm not ready. And if you're not ready, that's okay. Okay, my next thing is, and, and this piggybacks on what you just said, you're in the, I, I took uh, pieces of what you said to me when we talked on the phone uh, when we first met a couple weeks ago. Your style should be evolving with your age. Now, just for a second, stop, because I don't want to seem like such a fogey that I don't recognize People that have pink hair or primary colors for hair or different uh, body jewelry or body art, that can still be okay, can it not, if this is how you want to present yourself to the world, but there's a design concept around it? Am I on the right track? Yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, if you're covered head to toe in tattoos, I mean, if the way you dress, it doesn't have to be the only thing that you show. There is a way to do that. And be, if you're in the creative industry, if you're in a creative industry, that's what people look like. 
they, it is not taboo to have a tattoo or to have your hair a different color. If it's kept up correctly and it's in a, a decent style and your clothes show that you are dressing appropriately, excuse me, appropriately for your body type, there is a way to, to dance with that the right way, for sure. I mean, it, it, you cannot go for a job in finance and have six rings in your nose. It doesn't go. But if you are a creative director, if you are working on set, if you are in makeup, that is accepted. It just depends where you are. Well, what do we do with these people if they have to go to court? If they have to go to court, they got to reel it in. And they're not stupid. They know. They're, they know. It doesn't mean you can't have pink hair, but it's not recommended. I mean, it's just you cannot give people the ammunition to judge you in a negative way. And when you walk into the courtroom and you have pink hair and six rings in your nose, you're going to be judged. Sorry. No, when I'm I really do, happy you said that. When I, get, when I do corporate styling, I go into people's workspaces and I give a whole presentation about fashion, how to develop a style, what is a style, shopping. And the first thing I say before I even say my name is society is superficial, whether you like it or not, or whether you believe it or not. And if you don't believe it and you don't buy into it, you will be judged and you're just doing yourself a disservice. It doesn't mean you have to dye your hair just to go to court, but wear your hair in a conservative way. Tone the jewelry down, turn down tone the makeup down, make that secondary. If you're wearing a gorgeous suit and you have pink hair, people are going to say, wow, she's, she's edgy, but it, you know, she's dressed really well. Yes, 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 and yes. And I would add one thing, that if you have to represent yourself in court and you have primary color hair, and you really feel that you don't want to compromise that, so to speak. You'll compromise everything else. You'll, you'll, you'll cover up some of the tattoos. Maybe you'll take some of the facial jewelry off, but not much you can do with your, with your hair. I would actually bring it up. If I were a self-represented litigant, I would just say, Judge, I did my best. I wanted to respect the court, so I dressed more conservatively than I normally do. I just couldn't do anything about my hair because it, it just takes too much to go back and forth in color. And so I just wanted to say that I tried my best out of respect for the court. Do you know if you would say something like that, how that would positively impact the judge? I mean, I don't know anyone who would have the courage to say that, but that would impress me. Yeah. Yeah, that would so, impress me. I mean, for to say, look, I know I don't look like the typical whatever, but this is what I look like, and this is, you know, I really wanted to show you that I am trying to fit the part. Yes, yes, and so a lot of times, just bringing up the obvious to show that you're you're acknowledging it, and you you did the best you could, and there's just this one thing had to stay the way it was. I think that's be, spoke loads because when you go to court, you're so nervous. I mean, I would be nervous. I would be nervous if I had to go to jury duty. You're so nervous and you want to feel as comfortable as humanly possible. And, but you don't want to completely compromise who you are. So I guess I'm taking a middle road with this discussion right now. Um, but let's go back to you and how you would set people up for anything they do in their life. So your approach is a three-step approach. You consult, you do closet inspection, and you shop. Could you please walk us through these three steps? Yes. I meet you, and let's just use you as an example. I meet you, I talk to you for an hour, and we get real down and dirty. Who, what, when, where, who are you? Where are you in your life today? What do you need? What do you want? What's not working for you? And what's your block? Sometimes an example of a block is laundry. If you don't have a, if you have three kids and a husband and you're, you don't have a laundry system down, that is going to keep you from getting your style on point. Believe me, it will. Interesting. That's if, something that yes, routine. It is, it is a game changer. 
Um, if you have a financial block, which I mentioned before, if you're like, it's too expensive, I can't do it, no, 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 whatever. If you don't understand how much clothes costs, you, we, I'm going to have to walk you through that because clothes are expensive. And not everything, but a pair of shoes costs anywhere from $90 to $150. And if that's a lot of money for you, fine. We need to find something within your budget, but you need to wrap your brain around how much it costs to, to look good and to understand what you need in life to feel like you are keeping up with your age, your lifestyle, your career, and other people that will whiz by you. If you do not keep up and evolve your style with your age. I don't care if you're the same size for 30 years. I don't care if you think your clothes are still in style. They are not, okay? And you have to evolve with your age. You should not be wearing the same clothes from 25 years ago. It, you, you just should not. You have it's to easy evolve. to tell that to a woman, but to get a man to throw away that T-shirt from college? Oh, I, my, totally. That's exactly what I went through with my, with my husband. I mean, it's the same thing, but then you understand it is better. When you evolve with your style, with your age, it is better. So once we have that conversation, I, here are your problems, here are your issues. Everybody's got a story, right? Everybody's got a story. Then we go to the closet clean out. And that's where the work begins. I have every extreme. Somebody that has nothing, and I mean nothing like, excuse me, where are your pants? What do you mean you have no pants? What do you mean you have four pairs of shoes? That's it? I don't understand. From someone who has nothing to people who ever shop. And people who ever shop, or in, and then people in the middle. So people who ever shop is, you know, they're filling a void. So what is the void that we're filling? And why do you think you need so much that you clearly are not using? And then I change all the hangers. I reorganize everything. I show, tell you what to fold. I tell you what to hang. I organize your clothes. Like goes with like. And then after we, and that arms me for what you need when we shop. So I know what your blocks are, what your problems are, what you have too much of, what you need more of. And then when we shop, I pre-pull all the clothes for you before you even get there. So it's a very luxurious experience. You come into the dressing room and you just try on. And I have food and snacks and music and things like that to loosen people up a little bit. And then all they do is try on and then you buy. And then some people take it a step further where I come to your house because you've mixed old with new clothes and I style outfits from there. Styling is the last thing that I do because the, everyone who I work with, every, no client ex except, accepted, it's never about the clothes. When I work with you, your issues are not about your clothes. Your issue is everything else that is blocking you from developing a, a good style. Could it be from the way you feel, going back to a divorce situation, can it be the way you feel uh, if your husband or your wife does not pay attention to how you look anymore? Anything, or, anything from infidelity to attention to, uh, you know, ignoring the signs, putting a Band-Aid on your marriage, and then it finally comes to fruition for whatever reason, or you got married too young, or whatever it is, you know, it, it's just people, if you, it's hard, it's work. And when you grow apart, whatever the reasons are that you grow apart, you know, it can really affect everything. I mean, the depression, the anxiety, the, how you feel about yourself, how you feel about everybody else, how you feel, people feel about you in the workplace. The energy that you're showing when you show up is, is not 100% there because you're going through something. People, when they dress well and are proud of themselves when they go to an event, they beam. They actually have Absolutely. the energy of glowing and beaming. Yep. I find that interesting. Something else I just thought about, in your evolving marriage, if it's not going so well, would you say to take stock of any changes that have taken place 
of such a shift that may cause your mate not to be interested? Like, for instance, is it true that one of the first things to go in a marriage is what you wear to bed? I've never been divorced, so I'm not 100% sure, but I, as a professional stylist, I would tell you this. I am so worried about my wardrobe, but I need to up my pajama game. And when I'm laying around with my husband and, you know, watching TV or whatever we're doing, I want to look nice. I want to feel like I'm not glammed out in a boudoir shoot, okay? But I look sort of cute and I've got cute loungewear and I've got cute pajamas and I feel like I still look put together because I don't want my husband to feel like I'm a slob, you know? And so that's important to me. It might not be important to everyone else, but what you wear to bed absolutely makes you still make you're still awake still makes you feel good or not if you wear you know there are days where you wear old sweats whatever I mean everyone has those days but if you have a nice little wardrobe that you have for nighttime that helps it always helps it always helps to bring everybody back together at the end of the day. And let my, me tell you, I will leave you with this. I, yeah. I work so hard on my wardrobe. I told my husband, if I got to look good, you got to look good. Ooh. Yes. Yes and yes. Holly, I've loved talking to you today. I just, this is my secret guilty pleasure is talking about fashion and clothes and now talking to you where there's actually psychology, philosophy, and logic behind dressing well. I feel exonerated all of a sudden. I'm so happy. Thank you. And isn't it all about us? No, everybody, it's all about you. It's always all about you. And for any of you who would like to talk to Holly and pursue your own individual, unique look, Holly, how how do people get in touch with you? Um, I am very easy to find. So I am, my website is Holly, H-O-L-L-Y, Cats, K-A-T-Z, styling, all one word. Go on my website, send me an email, send me smoke signals, send me a DM, uh, whatever you want to do. I, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm Holly Cat Styling on Instagram. I'm Holly Cat Styling on Facebook. I'm, I'm Holly Katz on LinkedIn. I have a YouTube channel, Holly Katz Styling. I, I'm just... And I'm your all, podcast, let's not forget your podcast, Fashion my, Crimes. And my podcast is Fashion Crimes Podcast, where me and my stylist, because, you know, doctors have doctors. So that's what makes me a great stylist is that I have a stylist and he helps me tremendously. Um, and we talk about what's going on in the fashion industry. We push other people up into the spotlight, small designers, other people in fashion. Fashion has suffered so much from COVID. It's the understatement of the year. Oh, Retail yes. has suffered so much. Yes. So it's just a platform for us to serve and, and really be there for the fashion community, fashion community to get people to you know pay attention and look. And if you are going to buy, maybe you could buy from one of these people. That would be great. So yeah, tune in. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify, Pandora, Radio One, Radio Public, anywhere where you listen, Google Play. Please look us up. Follow us, like us, connect with us. You know, we're all Absolutely. about- Absolutely. And anybody serious, and I mean this seriously, anybody in the throes of a divorce, any little bit counts to make you feel better. And if you have a court date coming up for whatever reason, call Holly because it honestly matters in court and out of court how you dress and what you project because of the way you dress. Holly, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and the information you provided to us today. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And thank all of you for listening. You know I appreciate each and every one of you, and I hope we help each and every one of you. You have been listening to The Amicable Divorce Expert, and I look forward to speaking with you next week. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 